Let's make a team from 2013 was pitching in front of some um, angel investors in Boston. Uh, and I had to be there. And I did get out of that meeting until 5 o'clock and I jumped in my car. And then I drove to the wrong place. So uh, I left my car across the bridge all you're going to have to give me a ride over the bridge later. Uh, but hey, how have you got your idea plans in? And how many of you got word that you're going to be in the semifinals? Excellent. Round of applause. And if you did not get invited into the semifinals, don't worry. Difference Maker is still here. We're not going anywhere. We can still help you and find out ways to uh, move your idea forward and provide you maybe some feedback. Um, on why it didn't uh, move forward in the semifinals. But we're pretty excited about it. Right now, we're looking at about 25 teams that will pitch on April 3rd, I believe. Uh, we're reaching out to our alumni. I'm guessing we'll have somewhere in the vicinity of 20 alumni. I think it's a fun day. I don't know if Holly and Ha do. Because uh, it means setting up five rooms with four to five judges and all the logistics and then having the teams pitching it up. Uh, but the goal is at the end of that three hours or so, we'll come back with a list of ten teams that will be invited to present at the Idea Challenge Finals. And so it's, uh, it's exciting time for us, and I hope it's an exciting time for you. Now, Rocket Pitch. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. You know what Rocket Pitch is? Do you want to take a guess? Yes, please. An elevator pitch with a fancier name for a new generation? Oh, I like that. An elevator pitch with a fancier name. Yeah, yeah, basically. I think an elevator pitch is usually, what, about 30 or 45 seconds? You don't have, you don't have that elevator. A rocket pitch is a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, it's basically, it's your pitch. It's your pitch to convince somebody else that you have a good idea, that you have a group of people who can help you implement this idea, that you understand what the problem is you're going to address, and then ask them for the resources you need to move them forward. So it's a relatively um, concise but very important presentation. In fact, one of the challenges we sometimes see when people make their rocket pitch is um, A, they think having just a good, having a good idea is enough, and it's not. Um, or B, saying we're not really sure what we need, but we trust you to help you. That's not a good thing. Um, or C, not knowing enough about specifically who you're going to help. So those of you that have been attending the workshops for the last three or four, four, probably four snowy weeks, or any of you that are in our courses, you understand, right? We spend a lot of time drilling you on the opportunity, right? Because ultimately, you need to be able to chop that opportunity up into slices. And then you need to tell the judges which slice you're going to serve, how you're going to serve it, why it's important for you to serve it, and what you need to serve it. That's it. You're going to pull one slice out of it. You're going to paint the great big picture, and then you're going to pull a slice out. And so what we thought we would do tonight is talk to you a little bit about a rocket. How many of you have done a rocket pitch or an elevator pitch? I know you have. Catherine yeah, has. Do we have video? I don't even think we have. I don't think we have the video tonight. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Catherine actually helped deliver a winning rocket pitch. The team that won our first uh, uh, idea gave us my difference maker challenge back in 2013. Anyone else have one? How many of you have appealed to your parents for funding or permission? Right. You probably don't use a rocket pitch, though, do you? You're kind of like, Ma, I really need this. Dad, I really want this. Don't do that. Right? Don't say, we really need this, or somebody really needs this. Um, you wouldn't be up there if somebody didn't need it. And we do have people that will say that. So the challenge you have here is just having a good idea or doing something because it's the right thing, important, but not enough to win. Right? And you all are in this because you want to Get the resources, right? You want to win the resources. You want to get a nice plaque. You want to come into Difference Maker Central. You want to get the resources you need to implement your idea. So anybody who's in the semifinals, right, any team that's there, you have to be really serious about wanting to implement this idea. Because we're going to put you up in front of some pretty influential people. You're going to share and pitch your idea to them. 
They're going to go back into the back room and come up with a list of people who we're going to dole out $35,000 to over the next year. Um, and they're going to expect you to actually do it. And so that's the hot pot, right? This, this may seem like the hot pot. I'm telling you, this isn't the hot pot. Right? This is actually the fun pot, except for those of you who have uh, stage fun. And for you, this is a big deal. So for the rest of you, this is really the easier pot. Because if you win in one of the prize categories, then you have to implement the idea. And we're going to put you in a boot camp this summer, and we're going to help you get that idea off the ground. We used to let the difference maker teams go away for the summer, right? And say, oh, I'm going to the Cape, or I'm going to France, or I'm going to go work on my dad's boat. And then we couldn't find them in September, right? September would roll around, and we're like, all right, come on back, come on back. You've got $5,000, you've got $3,000, you've got to spend it. So the winners who are in it to win, we're going to help you get this thing off the ground by the end of the summer. So let me talk to you a little bit more about the rocket pitch. So we use, and this is a method we actually learned at Babson College, right? We, it, I, I think I mentioned we started an entrepreneurship program here back around 2007. But before we started that program, I went to Babson College. I spent some time there one summer. And I spent a lot of time. Babson is like the most famous entrepreneurship college in the, in the world, right? They're, just incre they have been incredibly successful at bringing out this story. And they actually introduced me to this concept of the rocket pitch. And basically, it's kind of a succinct, sharp, maybe four to six slide um, appeal, right? It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate what you know about the problem, what you know about the opportunity, how to solve it, and then an appeal um, for resources. And um, we give you, we're gonna, we'll give you five minutes. I think we increased that, right, Molly? It was, uh, I think, three minutes initially. And then people said they need a little more time. So now we're giving uh, five minutes to teams, which, I don't know, does that sound like a lot of time? It depends. If you have stage fright, it's a lot of time. Right? If you don't have stage fright, then you can go on and on. Um, it'll probably go by pretty quickly. Uh, and so what I thought I would do, and you have to excuse me because I've been running around all day, and um, my, my voice isn't the best. I'm going to do a rocket pitch for you in a minute. Uh, but before I do that, how many of you have heard of, heard of Mass Challenge? Anyone heard of Mass Challenge? So Mass Challenge is like the largest um, pitch contest accelerator in the world. And, and they, they started off bragging about that, and at first they were just bragging. But now they really are. And they have sites in, in the UK and Israel, and, and they give away a lot of money. But I was down there this morning because they're, um, they have had a big announcement because they're creating a makerspace. Do you know what a makerspace is? Steven, what's a makerspace? It's a place where people can just go and if they have an idea, they can use the resources there. Like it could be a 3D printer, a laser cutter. They can build things. Yeah, they can, they can build things, right? You make things. And uh, so they were all excited about that. So and we're now partners <laughs> with them. I went down and I signed an agreement, which means, which will mean good things for you. But I want to tell you something. They were all excited about this makerspace. We have one, right? We have one across the street that's opening probably mid to late April. The Dean of Engineering um, has about six to 7,000 square feet. And initially, it'll probably be just open during the classroom hours. But his goal is to have it open uh, 724, so that you all will actually be able to build the things. And, uh, and it's initially, it'll be in it primarily for engineers. Engineers will staff it, but we're going to work closely with them so that our difference maker teams can gain access to that space. So you'll have access to that. And then in June, we're opening, opening up 22,000 square feet of space. And 11,000 is going to be for the successful startups. So those of you who win the competition, who work really hard next year, get your idea off the ground, raise additional funding, we actually have space where you can launch your company out of. And we'll have some prototyping 3D printers over there as well. So we're, we're, this ecosystem that they're so excited about in Cambridge, we have it here at all. And we're going to help connect you to Boston when you need to connect with angel investors and those and mentors and those type of things. We'll help pull them in. But we're building something pretty cool for you right here. <clears throat> the reason I share that is because it reminded me when I was at Babson, right? Even though Babson was the coolest entrepreneurship um, program uh, college in the country and in the world, they didn't have a makerspace. They actually had a partner with another college because they were just focused on the business piece. And so over time, we've been able to look at what other schools are doing, start to bring some of these things and roll them out here for you. So there's some kind of funny looking slides up there. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. Now, this should be old hat, and I don't know if you can read that. I, there's an awful lot of, a lot of print on this slide. Is this my slide, Holly? She's ignoring you, know, she's ignoring me. Oh, I'm sorry. Me. Is this my slide? No, no, no. This is what you got. This is what the students have to, this is the format for the student okay. PowerPoint. I'm just saying there's a lot of print on it. I know. It's online, too. And these are just the key points you want to hit, so I just wanted to Make put sure it I didn't miss it. Yeah. She knew I was busy. She was afraid I would forget it. So, you know, we've been talking about this, the problem, the opportunity, the solution, the resource. So, you did an idea plan. We can hit on these points. We spent uh, four weeks working with you on the uh, business model, identifying the problem, investigating the opportunity. It was to prepare you for basically what's in the rocket pitch. So in the rocket pitch, you're going to talk about the problem that you're facing, the opportunity associated with solving that problem, the solution that you're proposing, and then what do you need in order to implement this idea. Now, um, so these questions, you, you've already seen all these questions, so I'm not going to go through all these. Um, and then, I, we say four slides, but honestly, I think most people end up probably doing five or six. Uh, and I'll show you, I'm going to show you one in a minute. And um, we use some tricks um, to fit more information on one slide using some of the animations and such. Uh, the other thing that we don't talk about here are props. Um, so if any of you are doing something, or any of, actually all of you should think about a prop. Right? Something that you can wave around or hand to the judges or show to people. And I've been to, I've been to hundreds of these, um, I've seen hundreds of teams pitch. Uh, and like the prosthetic device team has a, has a mock-up of their leg. The safety suture team had a cardboard mock-up. Um, I've seen a cake uh, going through the uh, E4All program. They've had a lot of restaurant and food-oriented pitches. They bring food with them. Right? And they get, here, would you like to try my soybean gelato? Successful company, soy-based gelato, woman, um, an immigrant, Asian immigrant came to the country, was trying to figure out how to clutch a business, went to eat for all. She's making a soy-based ice cream and gelato, and she's selling it in Whole Foods now, down in the uh, Boston, Cambridge area. And one of the reasons she got funding is it tasted good. She gave it to the judges who raised their eyebrows, just like you did, and then tasted it, and they said, oh, this is good. So props are very good. I don't have a prop tonight. <clears throat> but um, I think I'll, I'll get through this anyhow. Let me just show. Some tips before we get started. In every team, right, every team that's pitching in the preliminaries needs to present, needs to sign up for a time, and you need to present your rocket pitch to some of the fellows in the difference maker team. Correct, Holly? Yes. How do they sign up? Paper up front. Oh, actually, it's in my bag now. But okay. see me after. <laughs> All right, see you, Holly, to sign up for a slot. Uh, and the reason we do this is, for, you know, there's a couple of, re couple of reasons. One, for many of you, this is your first time doing it, so it's good to practice. Uh, and based on our experience, most of you will benefit from some tips and some guidance. Uh, and also, we're putting you up in front of some very high power people, right? So we want you to look good, and we want to look good. You're not only representing your idea, but you're representing this university in front of these folks who, right now, they may be giving you five or six or two thousand dollars, but what the idea is to prep you to ask people for two hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. Think of that. Has anyone here ever asked anyone for a million dollars? You never got it. <laughs> well, this past year, I asked somebody for. Five and a half million dollars. First time in my life. And we got it. Right? We got it. Now, I, I, a couple of years ago, I never thought I'd be asking people for that kind of money. But the timing was right. I felt confident. I had prepared my pitch. I'd done my research. I laid a good story out for them. They grilled me with questions, but I was ready for it. And they gave us five and a half million dollars to build the innovation hub over on Canal Street. So it's this is, think of this as the first step in a long journey. And so we want you to sign up so we can help prepare you for this presentation or this pitch to the investors. Um, some tips, technical jargon, right? So particularly, I think, with science and engineering students, there's a tendency to talk technical jargon and using terms that may not necessarily be familiar or that are familiar to you but not familiar to other people. It's good to demonstrate your knowledge of the problem and your knowledge of how to solve it, but if the judges want to know 
the type of polymer you're working with, uh, the chemical compound of the nutraceutical you're creating, or what's in your cookie mix, they'll ask you. Right? They'll ask you. They'll say, we're going to give them some time to ask questions. They'll ask you to say, so, why is that polymer you're making so special? How can, can you protect it with carbon, right? How are you going to protect that cookie recipe? So you don't, you don't have to give all of the secret sauce, as my friend uh, Professor O'Donnell would say. You don't want to let all the secret sauce up. So you want to be careful of technical jargon, and you want to be careful about spilling too much about what makes a solution work. They want to know that. They, they, they will definitely ask you. Um, you want to keep it simple. You don't want your pitch to be too complex. We were sitting in a pitch uh, recently. And this, um, the team kept talking about, well, we can launch our product in this state. We can launch it in Massachusetts with the, with the young people. Or we can launch it in California with this middle-aged group. Or we, we have some friends in Canada. And they kind of were going all over the map because they wanted to show how much work homework they had done and how they knew how it could apply. Totally lost the judges. The judges, what they really want to know, that you've defined a specific group of people that you're going to start this project with. And then after you've convinced them of that, <coughs> got some funding and actually done it, then you can go work with the middle-aged guys in California or the group of friendly people up in Canada. But you want to pick that initial target group first, and you want to start with that. And you want to convey that. If you put too much information out there, you have to, it's, it's a bit <coughs> you put out enough information to show that you're knowledgeable and that you've investigated the problem and that you're worth investing $5,000 in. But you don't want to sound, seem like you're all over the map. And that's a tough balance, particularly if you're nervous uh, and you're up on stage for the second or third time. But that's one of the reasons why we'll help uh, coach you on that. You want to have a core message, right? When we were talking about the business model, we were talking about value proposition. That value proposition should be your core message. Right? You, would, you might start with, the problem that we're facing, um, and so I'll use the, uh, the prosthetic limb, the problem that we're facing is that in developing countries, in third world countries, children don't have access to prosthetics because they're too expensive and too complicated and they don't have access to the healthcare system that will deliver it. It's a terrible problem that affects 500,000 people in Jakarta. That's the problem, very succinct. We're going to address that problem by creating a low-cost, rapid-produced limb that can be manufactured on 3D printing machines in the clinic and that will extend with the child over the child's life. That's a solution. Short and simple. Now, the truth is, there's a lot of different applications for that technology. But for the purposes of this one event, you pick one. You pick the one that you think you can accomplish and the one that's going to kind of capture their attention. You want to pick the important problem that you can accomplish, the solution that you can accomplish. Okay? Let's see. Props, I already mentioned props. Oh, pictures, charts, those things are very important. Having some animations or, or graphics which show people that you've actually thought about what this thing might look like. Now, engineers, I'm going to tell you, you don't need the final bill, okay? You don't need the final bill. You don't need a highly refined graphic. You can say, this is our working image, this is something we're starting with. We all understand that. This is a very early stage. We call, you're in the fuzzy front end, right? So when we talk about innovation, we talk about the fuzzy front end. It's when you first start to look at a problem and you start to consider all the different solutions. It's very confusing. There's a lot of information coming at you. You might be a little bit unsure. You think you can do it, but you're not sure you can do it. So at some level, you gotta just take a big breath. And you have to just focus on bringing one solution out the end of that pipe. With a, everyone understands, it may change. In most successful companies, most startups, the idea will change several times before they actually sell any product. So you don't have to have the finished product, but you have to have an idea of where you're going. Um, charts, we already talked about charts and graphs, and we talked about talking about the customer segment and the opportunity you're investigating. Um, tell a story, don't read the slides. This is why practice is important. If you have slides, I'm guessing everyone in the audience can read them. So you don't have to read. What you need to do is be careful about how much text you put on a slide, maybe four bullets, five at the most. You, don't, you want to try to avoid wrapping the lines down. And you want those bullets to be props for you, right? So Holly and her tease me, and Rachel can attest to this, right? I can put a slide up on the, on the screen. It could just have one bullet, right? And I could probably talk for 20 minutes 
about that one goal. Now, you don't have 20 minutes, right? But what I'm saying is you want to just have those slides as a visual prop for the audience. And maybe a visual prop for you, but you don't have to do this every time. Because that becomes obvious. I could do this every time. Now, I'll tell you what, I got, I'm doing a little trick here. When I'm doing this, I'm also looking at a couple of the different bullets. So I don't have to memorize everything that's up there, but when I look at one line, I'll look at two lines, so I'll understand what's coming next. So you've got to use these little presentation uh, skills. Uh, you don't have too much on the slide. You do want to have some graphics. You do want to have some shots. You want to use the slides as a prompt. And you really have to filter what you put up there, right? You only want the important information. There may be a lot of information. There should be a lot of information that you've already collected that nobody's ever going to hear unless they ask you a question. And it's your ability to answer that question that will help you to win the judges over. Right? If they ask you a question, say, well, I see you're talking about uh, developing an app, a gaming app for, um, for, for uh, uh, teen, uh, young adults and teenagers. Well, how does, that seg how does that group segment out? What kinds of games are they interested in? Now here, and I think I've said this before, do not use your opinion. Your opinion doesn't count at all in a pitch, right? What matters, right, is the information you've collected and the day that you can say, now, if a judge asks you, so do you think this problem is important? You can say, yes, I do, and this is why. Right? So it's an opportunity for you to help them to understand. But you want to try to avoid saying, well, I think, or my feeling is, you want to avoid those things, you really want to be sort of a fact machine, a passionate fact machine. And that takes a little practice. It's a weird combination, right? Facts and passion. But this is what's going to help you win and impress the judges. Um, so let's see, we talked about keeping it simple. Oh, a story. Telling a story. If you can start your pitch off with a story that describes the problem, that's one way of pulling the judges in and gaining their interest real quickly. Um, so if you think about it, on uh, April 3rd, the judges will sit be in, in probably between five and six pitches each. Uh, they'll be hearing one every 15 or 20 minutes or so. Uh, on the night of the finals, the judge is going to sit through 10 pitch presentations and then questions. They're going to be tied as it starts to get to the end. So if Luck of the draw puts you at the, the seventh or eighth, you know, everyone's starting to get tired. But if you can tell a good story that pulls people in and captures their attention, you'll hold it for the next 15 minutes. Right. So think about a story. And talk to, if you can't make one up, talk to someone else. Ask for help. Ask for someone else to help you come up with a good story. And then practice the story. And then, then you know, I, I think we told you don't take advice on investments or on your investments from like your parents or your friends. Um, but you can take their advice on a good story. Right? So practice the story with them. Yes? Um, so if we gave a survey to students <coughs> at UMass Lowell and we're targeting that segment, could we use the information from that survey to tell a story? I mean, yeah, we'll help percentage and stuff, but can we like take one and be like, so this girl tried to do this and then this? Yes. Thing? So let me qualify that, right? Surveys, excuse me, surveys are good. Um, but the challenge with survey is the N, right? The number of responses. Yeah. So if anyone tells me they've done a survey, I first I ask them, how many people responded? 65. 65. Yeah. We want uh, to get 100. We should probably get What's that? We want to get 100, so maybe we should get that. So out of how many? Students, you must all. <laughs> so uh, if we just count undergrads, we're talking about 11,500. Yeah. So, uh, somewhere in that city. So this is the challenge with survey data. Is people, it, it can be helpful, but people in that audience, me, including me, you can ask Holly and her about this, is I immediately start thinking, okay, what percentage, what's the response rate? How many people is that? Who does it represent? Yeah. So you're almost better saying something like, we talked to 100 people. <laughs> and out of that 100 people, half of them said. What you want to be careful about is representing a survey that really isn't a representative sample as fact. So when I say I talked to 100 people, or we talked to 100 people, and 25% of those people thought that this product would be helpful. Now, that's probably not a good number. Right? You'd really want to try to get it up 50 or 60 or maybe 40 or so. Then what I would want you to do is follow up. And then we ask them specifically, 
how would be helpful, what features would be helpful. And what that's doing is rather than relying on the survey, you're taking that data to sort of validate the development of the product. So it's different than what you do in a class, right, where you say, oh, well, uh, Smith and Tello did a survey of 255 undergraduates, and 80% of them said their lectures were boring. Um, <laughs> so I nod my head, and then I go on. But what I, if instead you say, we talked to 100 people. The people we talked to were people that were affected by this problem, or they had family members who were affected by this problem. 50 of those people actually had this disease. And they told us ABC. And, and I think, it, you're, so that's a story, right? That's different than just saying that we did this survey. And, and the other thing about a survey, right? If you talk to 25, if, if you say you have 25% res response rate, but you're only talking 60, or you have 25% of a sample of 65, out of a population of 11,000, it's not representative. And I've seen teams get in trouble by saying, oh, this represents 25% <coughs> of the population. And no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It represents the 25% of the 60. Oh, okay. so, so you just want to be clear. This is a sensitive subject. I'm sorry I go on too far. OK, good question. Any other questions so far? Yes? So what do you suggest for the team school, uh, which has uh, at least five, six members? Yeah. Do you suggest them for something? So I think you have to think about that. Um, you only have five minutes. Um, having everybody speak may not be the best use of the five minutes because people have different styles. Some people are better able to project. Some people could be really valuable team members but might, might not be good at presenting. Um, I, my guess is, and the other thing that happens is you don't want to confuse the judges trying to remember who the five people are, right? You want the judges to focus on your project and why it should be funded. I, I don't know what your thoughts are, and I, I, we have some of the faculty fellows here, so I'm going to toss this one out to you. What do you all think? I would go with your top two or three speakers, and everybody else is there to help answer questions at the end. Yep. Professor Mitchell, Professor O'Donnell, thoughts? It can get distracting, but you better practice it to death yeah. and make sure that that transition goes extremely smoothly. So it's doable, and I've seen it work well, but you better have it nailed. But no more than two or three. No more than I would say no more than two. Professor Jordan, do you want to? I think Tom just nailed it. <laughs> I, I think they both gave good comments. And I think that really puts a wrap on it. The team has to be honest with one another as individuals, recognizing they all have different strengths and weaknesses. And the idea is to win here. Right. You would be amazed at how quickly five minutes goes. It's going to go like that. Good. Good Any other questions while we're kind of rolling through? I know you're eager to see my picture. Uh, let's see. Don't exceed the five minute limit. You definitely want to practice this over and over again. And, and I think, Holly, what are we setting aside a half hour for the practice sessions? For the advisory sessions or right now? For the advisory sessions. Um, right. a, half hour, a half hour to an hour. Okay. Yeah. Right. So during that time, you'll probably get to do the pitch a couple times. Uh, and then you'll get some feedback. Don't stop there, right? Grab a faculty fellow, grab some other people, and practice it. You want to have it finely too. Remember, the job is to impress the judges, and the judges are important people. Right? They're busy, important people. So you want to be prepared. We don't want you to waste their time. We want you to do well with them, but we don't want you to waste their time either. So make sure you practice. There's homework, even though you don't get great. Um, we, we talked a lot about the opportunity, the pain, and such. Don't forget the resource slide, right? or your ask. Right? The resource is a kind of, so I, let me let you in on a secret now. Right? So we use this language, problem, opportunity, solution, resource. Right? What we're really teaching you about is how to start a business. But we don't tell you that when we start, first introduce this to you. Because we're afraid that the nurses and the philosophy majors or the sociology majors, I, I can say this, I'm a sociology, I was a sociology major, they might be turned off by this idea of starting a business. So first we lure you all in, we get you all excited about solving big problems and things that matter, which is very important. And then we sort of sneak in the business stuff. And uh, that's how you're going to you know, raise these, these funds that you actually need to, to solve these problems, which is really important. So the resource slide, in, um, in, in entrepreneurial parlance would be the ask. Now, 
something you have to think about uh, is what are the, you're, you'll need lots of resources to fully implement your idea. We understand that. Uh, and oftentimes the conversation with the judges, and I sit in many of these, they'll say something like, well, this isn't enough money for them to actually launch this business. And I say to them, that's okay, right? Because we can find more funding. If you have a good idea and you do this first part and it looks promising, we can help you find more money, right? The non-spec team received $5,000. They've gone on and they've won another $125,000 in different pitch events and such. And we have our own venture fund at the university that can invest up to $50,000 in an idea. And the UMass system has a bigger fund that can invest between $250,000 and $500,000 in faculty and student IP. So there's money out there. If it's a good idea, a really good idea, and you do the work, there's money. But what you have to think about on this resource slide are two things, the resources and the timeline. Right? So over the next year, we're going to accomplish A, B, and C. And we need $5,000 to do this. The $5,000 will allow us to do additional research on the prototype, develop a prototype, test it with five people, and make a decision about how we're going to manuf manufacture this device. Or we need $3,500 to launch our soup kitchen. We've talked to other organizations that said if we raise the $3,500, it'll allow us to get the license, to buy some initial equipment, and we have a partner who's going to give us free rent for six months. And so you're kind of putting together a picture. You understand that the three or a thousand or five thousand that you could win here isn't enough to do it all, but you're going to spell out for the judges what you think it could do. Now, they may argue with you politely. The judges are all very nice, too, by the way. They're not really scary. They're important, but they're not scary. They're doing this because they want to see you. They love you. The big, as a faculty member, and I think my colleagues, the, the biggest challenge were the development people coming to a site. Can you put this alum in front of your students? They'd like to talk to students. We're co we constantly have alumni coming to us saying they want to come into our class and talk to you. And so when we started the Difference Making Program and the Idea Challenge, they were really excited because not only do they get to talk to you, they get to talk to you for three hours or six hours. Uh, and then some of them actually become mentors and will come back and actually mentor your team on how to develop this business <coughs> the organization. Um, so they're not, they're not really scary. They, they want to see you succeed. They sat in this room, right? They sat in the classrooms just like you. They came here as a kid fresh out of high school, many of them first generation. They went through the program. They've been successful. And now they want to give something back to the school and to you. So keep that in mind, that they're really there. If they're asking you questions, it's really just going to help you think through how to do this the best way. And some of them will come up to you after the preliminaries and say to you, you know, I'd like to help you get ready for the finals. And if you see someone if during the event that's asking you good questions or shows real interest, and you are elected to go into the finals, find that person and ask them to help you. Because, I mean, you know us. I mean, we do this over and over again. But the judge is coming at it with a different perspective. And that's, that would be really helpful in getting you ready. So I think I've covered some of the key points. And what I'll do is I'll do a rocket pitch. And then I'll, I'll show you. Actually, I think I'll show them the rocket pitch that three point stick did first. That way, they'll give an idea. Yes. Quick comment on on, sorry, on this. Five minutes. You may be thinking, I can't tell enough of a story in five minutes, right? In the real world, that may be all you get. What do you think the real purpose of a pitch like this is? The real purpose in the real world. Say again? Sell your idea. OK. It goes along those lines. Is it to close a deal? To get them to ask questions. OK. But to what purpose? To get the next meeting. To get the next discussion. And what Steve just said is spot on. As you're giving that pitch, people are asking really interesting questions. Somebody's in the audience that you see is in that industry, and you've caught their interest. Follow up. Because this is all about continuing the conversation getting the next meeting. And they'll ask for more information, more details, and eventually, down the road, you'll close the deal. You're not gonna close the deal on a five minute pitch. There's no way. Get the next meeting. That's the purpose. In this case, make some money, but get the next meeting. I like that. 
Get, get the next week. It's interesting. We have um, at M2D2, we have M2D2 is our medical device incubator, and we have uh, angel pitch events every quarter, every three months. And it took us a while to get the angel investors, mostly are located around cities. So they're in Boston, they're in Providence, they're in New York. They, they didn't want to be in Lowell, right? Lowell was too far away, right? It was 35 miles north of Boston. It took us a while to get them to come to Lowell. Um, eventually we did because we had a good reputation. We had some of the medical device companies that were doing really well. So they wanted to see what other potential startups or successes might be there. But the point of those meetings, we might put four to five startups in front of the angels. We'll have anywhere between three and five or six angel investors. And angel investors, um, angel investors are usually people who will make an investment under a million dollars. And if you start to go over a million dollars, or to a couple of million, normally you start to deal with a, a venture capital firm, or maybe an angel syndicate. Um, probably, uh, I think to be qualified to be an angel investor, you have to be qualified to make a $25,000 minimum investment. And then it can scale up from there. But these are people who have, uh, have extra money to invest, and they know it's risky. Um, and so they're the kind of people you want to bring into your entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Because I'm offering you maybe $5,000. Well, at some point, you're going to need 25, or you'll need 50, or you'll need 100. And there are people, and there are groups, and there are organizations that can help you get that. So what happened is we were able to get the angels to start coming up. And then people always say to me, oh, so who won? And it's like, well, no one really wins in those initial meetings. It's about getting the next meeting. And then that conversation, like if you're asking someone for $5 million, normally it doesn't happen in a pitch conference. It's, that's the kind of conversation that might get started, but then evolves over time. And so we're in this work for the long haul, you're in it for the long haul, and this is the, the first few steps. Okay, I changed my mind, Molly. I'm ready to go. All right. I'm ready to go. I got all work. I'll time you. All right, Stephen, can you do me a favor and keep time and give me a two minute warning? Okay. All right. And then no. tell me when to stop. All right. So this is an actual rocket pitching that we developed. Uh, so I, I, was on, I spent a couple of weeks at Babson with a bunch of faculty from around the country, and they broke us up into teams like you are, and we had to develop a rocket pitch uh, for a product. So I'm going to do my rocket pitch for you, and I'll let you critique it after because um, I, I may be getting a little dry here. So let's see. Stephen, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. You're ready. Air travel. How many of you have flown? Everybody, look at that, this is great. Perfect audience for me to share this product with you. What comes to mind when you think about air travel? How many of you have missed a flight? How many of you have been stuck in long security lines? How many of you have been through the hassle of being searched or pulled aside? I'm looking at my faculty as well. Who's <laughs> Professor Jordan there? How many times do you get this <laughs> Air travel is not what it used to be. There's over 200 million business flights per year. That's a lot of flights. There are a lot of people moving through those airport security lines. A security wait of 30 minutes is nothing nowadays, right? We've had 30, 45 hour long waits to get through security. Flying is not what it used to be. The hassle of flying means some people just stare away. But those of you that have to fly need to fly with securities. Securities is a new product that my colleagues and I hope to bring to market. It's a briefcase, but not just any briefcase. It's a briefcase that will open up with a see-through flap where you'll maintain your laptop. So rather than having to take your laptop out of your bag, you'll open it up, they'll see it there, and it'll slide through. Securities also has a document compartment, a cell phone case, and an RFID tag. So in case you walk away and you forget your laptop at, or you forget your briefcase at the security station or you misplace it at the gate, our RFID tag will help in tracking that device out and help you to get through, find your bag, get on your plane without any problem. Now, it's not just a briefcase that we're selling. We're selling a service. We're selling a service that's going to help you get through that security line in faster times. We're going to work with the FAA and Homeland Security to implement a speed lane. And if you have a securities briefcase, you'll also have access to the speed lane. 
You'll pass your bag through, you'll move through the line, we'll work with TSA to make sure that we have pre-approval, and we're going to target initially 14 major domestic markets. We'll roll it out in the U.S. first at major hubs so that you business travelers will be able to move back and forth through your destination more, uh, more efficiently. In addition, we're going to create a uh, supreme package where in addition to moving through the security line, we can also help provide you with additional airport data, car data, hotel data, all the information you need to be a successful, safe, and rested security business traveler. This is a wonderful business opportunity, and we've been thinking about the path, we've been working on the projections for the path of moving this product in the market. And as you can see, we project the initially starting in year one, we'll start with zero units. We anticipate 30,000 units in the market by the uh, end of the second year. We'll ramp up as we move into new markets on the West Coast. We'll increase sales to the 50,000 and eventually to the 100 and 120,000 um, unit market. We're working on our pro forma right now, which will break down our per unit cost. We've already contacted a major luggage manufacturer who helped with the manufacture of the product. And the technologies to implement the RFID at the airports are already in place. We estimate 55 million U.S. business travelers per year and an estimated sale price of $150 per unit. So what do we need from you? In order to kick this off the ground, we need $500,000 in seed money. As I said, we've already talked to the manufacturer. We know the pricing to get the unit uh, per unit cost. We'll spend a chunk of that funding on the brand development. Our initial target will be two to three major hubs. We need your resources, we need your network connections, and your assistance. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Remember, securities will solve your airport travel problems. <laughs> 406, a minute to spare. Any questions about securities? So you have to remember, right, this product was, this was a few years ago, it was before they got they do. They have fast lanes now, um, and I don't think they're making you take your. Not everyone. Not every airport. Yeah. If you're pre-approved. Yeah. So it's a good thing nobody actually invested in this product uh, six or seven years ago, <laughs> because the changes would have uh, led it to be uh, rather uh, irrelevant. So. <laughs> okay. Any critiques? Yes. Sometimes it was hard to like keep up because as I'm taking in one fact, you're already on to the topic after the next one. Yes. And so so you're right. Tom, uh, Professor O'Donnell, do you have a comment? Did you hear his comment was it was fast, there was so much information coming. It's hard to sort of stay on top. Any thoughts? Don't think you have to put everything in the presentation. And here's the key. Be selective in what you leave out that will lead to a question that you will be able to answer because you're prepared for it, right? So some of that stuff, for instance, maybe the, the size of the market, right? There may be some details behind that that if Professor Dell left out, somebody listening to it say, I want more, they'll ask it in the Q&A. So in reality, you have five minutes for the pitch, but you have 10 minutes total. Be selective in what you, not so much that you dilute the story, but that you kind of prompt the questions. Professor Jordan, what about the presentation style? Well, I thought the presentation style was excellent. I do want to add on to what Tom said. If you have backup slides and they ask you a question and you put up a backup slide, that leaves them with the impression that you have been thorough in your research. So that's an important thing to do to have backup slides. So to Tom's point, when they do ask you that question, if you can pull up the slide and answer it, the assumption is that your research is jumped tight right across the board. And the second thing is it seems to me that product lends itself to a mock-up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I should have had a little cardboard or a poster board box here with me. Yes? Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering if this would be a good or a bad idea. Do you have one in mind? Like, um, I guess if you had something on there, it's like, how would we like work with the TSA to find a fact that it's lost? Like, that's something that would take too long to describe. I think
think I would let them come up. They're going to come up with questions. I think I would have them do that rather than trying to lead them. I, I, because, so the challenge, so the question was, what about having a last slide that leads some questions out there for the judges to ask you, um, to show that you know more. So the challenge there is, first of all, they may have other questions that they want to get to. And it may just be a little confusing. And, and so I like the idea of having backup slides. So if somebody asks you, so how, how is this market segment? And who, who are the different, you mentioned uh, working with uh, young adult males, but what about the senior population? Could they benefit from this video game? And maybe you have a slide that sort of segments out that you can say, oh yes, as a matter of fact, or even better, if you're able to talk to the judges about it while one of your colleagues, one of those other four or five people on the team, clicks to that slide. Because you want to use you want to use your time wisely with them. Good questions. You notice how I started it out by connecting with you, and of course with air travel it's relatively easy. But I ask you, how many of you travel? How many of you have waited in lines? How many of you have done this? So reaching out and trying to connect with the judges. Yeah. So nobody raised their hands to the personalization question. Nobody air traveled. Would you have to improvise and do another question to see if there is another way? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> so it, I, I think you do. You want to be careful about what you ask, right? So I know when I ask a question, even in class, normally, I, if, if, I, if I have a sense I'm not going to get any answers, I'm probably asking that question on purpose to make a point to the class. But in a pitch, I want to ask questions that I think I'm going to get some response to. So you want to test those out. Because it could lead you down the hole quickly. Yes, the problem? There's, there's two approaches, I think, to that. The approach that Professor Dell took about asking the open questions, or a real quick story about somebody who has that problem. And it puts a, a real person, you know, my grandmother has blah, blah, blah. Or somebody you know has dot, 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 and they've experienced this. This can solve the problem by doing A, B, C, and D, blah, blah, something like that. So I mean, there's two different approaches, and it's a good point. Nobody, personally, if nobody connects with that, it's like, oh crap, what am I going to do? Right? And you don't want to waste time waiting for hands to come up, right? <laughs> Looking around the room, thinking, uh oh, now what do I think? So practice them up. Yeah, I think practicing in front of people who can represent the kind of ignorance, and I mean that positively, that your judge is going to have will give you some sense of whether or not the question makes sense and it's going to make the connection, because you don't want to force it and then have nobody know what you're talking about, or to open with a different approach. It also is going to give you some sense of what kind of questions your judges are likely to ask you, and that gives you a sense of what you need to prepare for. Practice means everything. Good point. And, and just to distinguish, when you pitch in the preliminaries, it'll be a small group. It, it'll be your team, maybe a couple of observers, and the five judges, and a faculty fellow. So it'll be a small group. So it, would, it could be risky asking a question that, with that group. When you, if you make it to the finals and you pitch in the finals, there's going to be 120 people in the audience. So chances are, when you toss a question out there, there's going to be a response. How much time is there between the preliminaries and the finals for the engineering competition? 14 days, all right? No, less, 12. 12, 12 yeah. days. And the preliminaries are April 3rd. So. Preliminaries are April 3rd and the finals are the 15th. Mm -hmm. Yes? Are the finals like the same as the preliminaries, like just another walking pitch to the audience? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's still um, it's still the rocket pitch. Hopefully you, you'll get some feedback from the preliminary judges and you'll incorporate that. And I think we're planning to uh, grab a hold of them, right, during that 12 days? Yeah. And help, help you to reply. Great questions, other questions? So um, one of the things that I did, and it's because I haven't practiced this, right? Uh, I left some time on the clock, which isn't a bad thing to do, but you don't want to leave too much time on the clock. Yep? What's the penalty for going over time? 
We'll basically, we'll cut you off. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, we, <laughs> <laughs> so the penalty is you don't, you might not make your ask, for example. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Is how quickly is it? Five minutes. What's that? I think it's at five minutes. At five minutes, the alarm goes off. There's no trap door or anything. <laughs> but if you see me coming up on stage, that's <laughs> about audience. Professor Finch, yeah? Yeah, I, so touching on the time thing. So one thing I've noticed that even when students have practiced a lot, then they finally get up there and they're terrified that they're not going to fill their five minutes. So they start ad-libbing stuff in. So you want to make sure that you stick to what you had practiced and try to maintain your pace. And I agree with you. Better to have land 30 seconds left rather than, and don't say your most important thing for the end, obviously. <laughs> Um, that could get cut off. You want to make sure that you have that delivered early. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You want to make sure you get your ass out there with some in that last minute. So. Yeah. We had an issue like that in a prototyping competition. We had hit our five minutes just as I said, and now my sister's going to go into um, the, our down the road plan. And then Dean Hartman was like, you're going to have to try that again. <laughs> but luckily we had got that out there. Yeah. So the judge, the first question was, "What are you What's your down the road plan?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it kind of, that's kind of relates to your comment about putting a question out there. Right? <coughs> yeah. So they, he did follow up in that case. Professor Brown, um, how many of you have been to the final pitch event? Raise your hand if you've been to the final pitch event. Okay, mm -hmm. not that many. So I wanted just to be really clear describe to you what the preliminary looks like, just in case you don't know, compared to what the final pitch looks like. The preliminary is in a small room that's about a third or a fourth the size of this room, with a ceiling about as high as this, maybe a little bit higher. And it's small. It's, it's not a huge audience. Like There's not an audience like in this room, obviously. The room would be big enough. The final pitch event is in a room about this size, right? Big, a bigger room. A bigger room. To Bologna Hall. Oh, we're moving, okay. And you're up on a stage, yep. right? And you're in front of a large audience. How many people are we talking about here in the audience? 100, I'd say 100, 150. 150 probably. 150 people. I would think potentially more this year, right? So the two different events are, 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 are by order of magnitude, very different. So just so you get a picture in your head, I'm not trying to freak you out or anything, but just so you get a picture in your head, because you might not know, you ne none of you have ever been in the preliminary pitch, right? Anybody been in the It's possible. No, because um, those are closed. You don't have an audience there. You can't bring your mom and, hey, look, and be your favorite professor. You can't do that in the preliminary pitch. You either might be members of the public in the final pitch event, That's right? Like deans and professors and your mom, right? So um, just wanted to get you a, a picture of that. Now, I had a, 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 some students presenting today. I, I was thinking about it because you were talking, Steve. And, and, and everybody's alluded to this, but I just want to drive this home. These students were fantastic when they did their presentation in class. And I asked them, how many times did you practice? And they said, we practiced as if we were doing it with a timer and an audience a dozen times. And the rest of the class was shocked. They were like, a dozen? That's a lot. And I said, that's a minimum. And that's why they were able to go to their extra slides. And they know, knew right where they were. They were able to, they had a screencast. I'm not suggesting you do that. But they were able to go back on a time signature in their screencast. They were able to answer questions. One person ran the machine, while their front person, who was obviously the most articulate, did most of the talking. And a third person chimed in on questions where they had expertise. So that's none of that. And because of what you just said, Deb, I want to drive this home. None of that is by accident. And if you start going, you're going to plan that and practice it. And if you start going off the rails and making things up as you go, you're going to find in the end that that was a mistake. So practice it until you get it right. Seek, seek out people like me who can practice it in front of me if you want. 
and, and I will give you some feedback. You can practice it in front of a small audience. Because the practice is you know, make you feel more comfortable when you get up there. Okay? Yeah, no, those are excellent points. And it reminded me of two others. One, make sure your presentation works before the event. And Holly, I believe that we asked them to send us the presentation ahead of time. Yes, right? absolutely. So you don't have until the morning of the 3rd or the morning of the 15th. Holly and I will send you out a note saying, we need your presentation by this day. And that's because we want everything loaded, make sure that it works. Um, and when we do the preliminary, it's kind of rapid fire. We bring the teams in one after another. Um, we don't want you coming in, trying to plug in your computer, find out if it works on the network. We want everything ahead of time and make sure it works. Question? Yeah? What if we're at Well, video you can send us, right? Yeah, we can send you a video. Yeah. So we can get that ahead of time. All right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you have a special installment or something like that, we could put you in front or at the end so it doesn't affect other teams as well, especially in the preliminary. You don't want to delay the time of other team. So you could be present last in that room so it doesn't, you know, set up time, they need more time. My That's recommend, right. Haas talking from experience, we had some come in, use their own computer. We asked everything to be in a PowerPoint presentation. They use something, Let's put that other thing online. Like Impre yeah, Imprezi, right. They did their own computer. They got the projector to work, and then we couldn't get the projector to work, to reset, right, back to the other one. So then the next team lost, was the, the whole thing was delayed because we made an exception for one person. So that's one of the reasons why we're pretty strict about this. The other thing too is, it's really risky to demo software during one of these things. You have five minutes. You don't want to be fiddling around showing someone how, so you want some screenshots, right? If they want to see how it works, bring your own laptop, have it there, and say, oh, well, I actually have the beta running here. But I, you, you don't really have time to be showing them, well, here's the new menu command we implemented, and we got this. Take a series of screenshots, use PowerPoint, to, you can you turn them into animations and things like you want to stage it, right? You don't want to do anything live like that. Tom, would you agree with me on that one? Yes, and one other point on the whole practice thing, I can't tell you how many times it's something practice is not memorized word for word for word, okay? Because you can just see the script going in their head, and all of a sudden they forget a word and they go off into nowhere, man. Know the material, feel comfortable with the material. But don't think you have to repeat every single word. Just get the message out there. And that is, that's a really fine balance, but you'll know when you know it. And I think what John said is spot on. 10 to 12 times, bare minimum, bare minimum. And just like in class, you can't use this. We had a team. We had a team that got up in front of us, and maybe some of you were there, a thousand freshmen on convocation a few years ago. Group, I won't name them. Um, <laughs> they got up, oh yeah, we're ready, Professor Teller, we're ready. We've got the president and the chancellor and Desh -desh, everyone up on stage in our caps and gowns. First team gets up, does a great job. The next team gets up, which I'm really kind of on, they had a great idea, they get up there to pitch, and all of a sudden I see him pull out his smartphone. He's reading from his smartphone. And then it freezes. And then he can't do any, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that does not go over. I, if I had a hook, I would have hooked up. Yes? Um, I say know your team, know who you're working with, because maybe you have people that can communicate better, you know, use that person to then talk. And then if you have another person that is more shy to then coordinate or something else. So know your team. That's very essential in whatever you're trying to do. Very important, yeah. And I think, uh, as Professor O'Donnell said, you might have one person, maybe someone advances the slides for you, right? And maybe someone else has really deep understanding of that market opportunity, but maybe they're not the best presenter. So you have them up there. They don't necessarily present, but if that question comes up, they're there to answer it, to help you tell you about that. Um, yeah? The other thing, you just reminded me of this, is all the people that are presenting, let's say you have two or three people presenting, and you might have other people on the team who aren't going to talk. Everybody should know everybody's parts. 
because I had a team that I mentored, and I had one of the people who was presenting on the team, this was last year, she froze up, and she, she looked great, and she practiced great, and she froze up, but another team member, because they knew each other, was able to pick it up. And, it, and I noticed it right away, but nobody else did. Nobody else did. And the other thing I just thought of because you picked up the phone is make sure you turn your phones off before you <laughs> Yes, and one other thing. Dress is important, right? No jeans. Yes? When you're making a presentation, you gotta think in terms of what do I want them to know? What do I want them to do? That's the ask. And how do I want them to feel? Emotions are an integral part of decision making. You want to leave the judges that you are confident, that you are enthusiastic about your idea, and that your team works very well together. Right? And emotions are an integral part of decision making. So think in terms of the whole experience, not just the content. Right? You want to look good, right? And you want to look like a team that's well practiced and confident and enthusiastic about what you're presenting. And as, and as Professor Jordan said, you're, you, you are trying to convince these people to invest in you. And so it's one thing when we're having our workshops and we wear our casual clothes and hang out. But th these are formal events. Um, so you want to look sharp, you want to dress up. The, um, and the, I, honestly, the finals event is, is a big deal. It's a big deal for the chancellor and the executive vice chancellor. Um, they'll, everyone will be there. We'll probably have press there as well. Um, most of the deans will, will come to that event as well. And so not only is this your chance to impress your judges, but it's also a chance to impress your dean and other people uh, in, in the organization. So please keep that in mind. So. OK, uh, these are great questions. Any others? OK, yep. Um, if, uh, say two people are speaking at the presentation, would you introduce everyone that is presenting to you? I think introducing your team is good. Um, and you, so the challenge you run into is if the team gets too big. So you want to make sure, uh, okay, this is Betty Smith. Betty Smith's a computer science major. This is Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer is painting the fence over here. This is Huck Finn. Huck Finn has expertise. In <laughs> <laughs> so you want to, I think it's good. I, I was thinking if only three people, think I give six. Mm -hmm. Why not just list the six names? and have the three folks who are going to be a part of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could certainly do that. Have, you can have, this is, uh, I'm Pete, this is Bob, this is Betty. We're going to present the product. You go into the wrap, and then you could have a team slide. You say, maybe there are six. Maybe this ten, maybe it's a huge team, right? And if that's the case, no, you don't want to parade them all up on stage. We'll, we'll help you figure that out. If you have like a very big team, like 10 people, would you have them all on stage scribbling their thumbs? No. No. <laughs> no. No. Put us, take a slide, put their pictures on it. Okay. Or maybe if they are program or whatever their roles are, just pop it up there. And, you, and, and then you might say something like, you can see we have a large team. The team members come from different disciplines. So if you have 10, you probably don't want to announce all their names, right? Yeah. You can have a slide. You can see that they come from just different disciplines. It's helping us to understand how to develop this product. We got the business field represented as well as engineering and marketing and that sort of thing. So yeah, no, that's fair. Did you have a question? Um, say if they were answering questions potentially, would you want them just like kind of sitting nearby, like front row or something maybe? So if if you them? have 10 people, probably not. <laughs> Because first of all, we probably don't have space for them. I mean, certainly they can come into the preliminaries. We can make some room in the back. Um, but if you have, you want to be careful about having too many people going in too many directions, right? And that's probably having two to three people who are going to take the lead and answer questions is probably best. So in your case, you're probably thinking a technical person, a, a business person, a health person. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I was just thinking with that many people, you don't want to run, run the risk of having a question asked and somebody answers it and someone else says, well, not really because, you know, and then you start, you know, discussing it between yourselves and it, and it really can happen. So. 
Have you seen that? Yeah. <laughs> Good questions. Any others? All right, let's show you uh, um, another pitch. This is from a team that won the uh, first to market uh, award. Three point stick. So it's Steve, because notice the enthusiasm on this presentation and the engagement with the audience. If you're not enthusiastic about what you're doing, they're not going to get enthusiastic. today know someone who's had back pain. People with back pain are actually within the majority because non-impact injuries like back pain are at epidemic levels. The American Pain Foundation tells us that up to 80% of us will experience back pain at one point in our lives and up to 27 million Americans are suffering from back pain every single year. The American Medical Association tells us that since 2004 we have more than doubled the amount of money spent towards these issues and on top of that, the American population are reporting more pain and more disability related to the issues. We're spending up to $86 billion related to issues that don't even trace back to a severe injury or a severe illness. And as rehab specialists, what we're starting to see is people have completely lost their ability to move properly through the hips while maintaining proper spinal posture and breathing mechanics. Now, we tend to try to correct these issues with things like verbal cues but we still often see a disconnect between how we would like the client and patient to move and how they actually move. But that's not their fault, because verbal cues mean absolutely nothing until you can actually feel what we're talking about. So we truly believe, in order to eliminate this disconnect between client and professional, and to help take people out of this unnecessary pain epidemic, is to bring verbal cues to life, so that you can actually feel what it's like to move well, and so that it's no longer just a verbal cue. If you're someone that loves to be in complete control of your own body while constantly reassuring yourself of right versus wrong during exercise and training, then you are going to absolutely love the new innovative product that our team has developed for both rehabilitation and injury prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the three-point stick, a precisely engineered collapsible dowel with a slot to accommodate dual elastic breathing straps. You feel the breathing strap expand and contract around your abdomen, assuring you of proper abdominal breathing mechanics. Maintain three contact points with the dowel to assure you of proper spinal posture, and feel yourself lose a point of contact as you come out of proper alignment so you can immediately self-correct your own movement. The three-point stick is already proven to work. It's patent pending. It's free of complicated technology, free of sensors, and free of batteries. We have a doctor and two expert physical therapists supporting this product and have already expressed the fact that, they, that we, as a profession, need this product. Currently, our target market will be movement professionals, consisting of about 500,000 professionals as of right now, and estimated to be about 700,000 professionals by the year 2020. We will need funding for LLC formation, trademarking, manufacturing and production, marketing material, and further developing our marketing model in order to bring the three-point stick to the people, to help reduce health care costs, and to bring people to a level of function that they never thought possible. Ladies and gentlemen, the three-point stick represents a higher standard for movement quality, and if brought to the market, I promise you, the three-point stick will make a difference. Thank you. Oh, well, well, bring the three-point stick to the people. <laughs> So we have a YouTube channel, and a lot of these videos are up there. But uh, you don't necessarily want to watch all of them. This is what. So what did you notice about that pitch? Yeah. Very confident. Very confident. Very enthusiastic. He made eye contact with different members of the audience and used a lot of hand motions to show how enthusiastic. And so that at the finals, the stage is about maybe this high, right? So you're going to be about here. And the judges will probably be about here. Right? So they're going to be right in front of you. And then everyone else is going to spread out around you. So he made eye contact. What else did you notice? He had his whole speech all mapped out. Like he knew exactly where he was going and went from beginning right to end. He was a pitching machine, right? He was like, and he, pitching isn't his major. He, he's a successful physical therapist. He was finishing up the graduate PT program. Yeah. So 
He legitimized their process. Their, to your point earlier about feedback from people. Yeah. He, he has a harmony. He's like rapping. Yeah, yeah. He had rhythm. Way back, yeah. Oh. Uh, no, no, just okay. <laughs> yep. Um, I think as one of the <coughs> professors mentioned, he was a fact machine. Like kind of, he had all the facts. Like, he had all the facts. And, he uh, wasn't looking at the slides. <laughs> yeah. He had a nice suit on. He looked sharp, didn't he? <laughs> all, all of them, except for the guy in the shorts. But one thing, I didn't know about that. <laughs> but that was perfect, right? That guy was his prop, right? right. He came out, he tested it out. He emotionally connected with the entire audience. How did he do that? He made it. He made it so it sounded, he used keywords like epidemic, real, not really bad, epidemic levels of injury, bit worth billions of dollars, huge numbers, and we have the solution. So all those things underscored the importance of solving this problem. Yep. Those are great products, so easy to demo, but I, I don't feel like I understand when exactly the consumer is very exactly when the times are. Yep. Right. So he, and so that, that's a fair question. So I say, well, I got the product, but I didn't understand when you would use that. So that would be a question. That would, that came up actually when they started asking questions. So fair enough. Yep. He was very articulate and he was passionate. He was passionate and articulate. So a challenge sometimes. So um, we should probably get a wireless mic for people to practice on. How many of you have actually stood up in front of people with one of these? Just a few, right? So, like if you hold it over here or down here, it doesn't do much good. I have a loud voice. I've been preaching for decades now. <laughs> I don't really need the microphone. But many of you don't have that experience, right? And so that can be a real problem. So you've got to practice projecting. And maybe you'll get a microphone so you can practice holding it at least. And we'll uh, shoot elastics at you if you put it down. Yep. Uh, just taking advantage and to make this announcement now, but ODK is going to be planning a mock speech event. So anybody who wants to go and get practice, we're going to be doing speeches in front of a live audience for fun, but also more importantly to practice communication skills. Why don't you tell them what ODK is? Sorry, ODK is the um, Omicron Delta Kappa, the National Leadership Honor Society. I'm the co-communications chair, and we'll be planning this event. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing it the first couple weeks of um, April. So it's still in the works, but just keep an eye out for that. I'll send out an email. It'll be great practice. So and if you send that to um, Ollie, we can get it out to everybody. So. Yeah? Um, kind of question. So when you did your rocket pitch, right. someone pointed out that you were talking very quickly and had a lot of facts and was a little overwhelmed. Right. He was talking even faster than you were and had even more facts. Uh, would you say, that's a bad thing to talk too quickly and like the overwhelming, or just, I don't know. What kind of well, you? so is he talking too quickly for you all? No, no, no. Why not? Okay. Yeah. I was just gonna say he kind of created a sense of urgency for us to like want more, basically. Yeah. Professor Jordan, I think you wanted. I I think that he almost sounded like a professional pitch person, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think if he had very speed of pitch pitch that it would have been much more compelling to me. Yep. Right? This was almost selling used cars. Gotcha. So I think, no, no. It, it was, he was well selling used cars. Yeah. But I think if he had very distinct and slowed down at times, that would have been more compelling. And the other thing along those lines to think about is the dramatic pause, right? Yeah. So working in a pause, asking a question, giving people time to think about it moving through a little bit, and saying to people, what do you think about that? This is an important point, isn't it? Right? Or making a statement exactly. like yeah. that to drive home, and giving them a second to register. Little things you can do to drive home. The, the power point. of the pause. Power of the pause. Yes? Well, going on that, um, how many times did they pitch before that? Because it sounded like it was almost automatic. Like he could have just done that when he woke up. And like yeah, no, they, they had not, they had never pitched a product to anybody. They had done the preliminary, 
and some practice, but they had they they had to pitch this. So they were all PT majors too. And no, no, I'm like this video. Like how like early on was this video? This oh this video was at, at the night of the end of the finals. Oh, okay. So they had pitched in the preliminaries, practiced, and then this was from the finals. Fair questions. I think we have another one in here. Hello, my name is Noel Khan, and my name is Rachel Paquette, and today we'll be talking to you about the BioBubbler. I went to Haiti in January in order to implement the first BioBubbler system, and while I was there, I saw the true need for a water sanitation system in Haiti. I saw children as young as four and five going to their local water well in order to obtain their water for the day. These water wells are shallow, surrounded by trash and sewerage containing water that no child or person should be obligated to drink. On another occasion, one of our friends did not show up to the Haiti Development Center because the night before she had bleach into her water um, that it caused her and her family to be rushed to the hospital. These occurrences are normal in Haiti and opened my eyes to the true need for a reliable and inexpensive water sanitation system. I will now pass it on to Noel, who will talk about the bio-bubbler and the other problems in the world. So one of the major waterborne diseases in Haiti comes from bacterial um, diarrhea, and about 7% of the population tend to die from that. Um, so the current problem right now with the sanitation system is that it's very expensive. There is an osmosis system that can be taken down there, but there's technology needed for that, there's electricity needed for that, which um, they don't really have much of. Another way of sanitizing their water is the chemicals that Rachel talked about. Again, that's a problem because people got sick from it and so much of the population is dying each year. So here's our BioBubbler. This one was our original design, but after doing a little bit of marketing research, we realized that the people of Haiti want something to look like an actual bubbler, just like that one. Um, because it shows that you're wealthy in Haiti. People in Haiti that are wealthy actually have clean water through a bubbler. So it's made from completely indigenous materials, um, such as a banana bark tree trunk. Um, it purifies water by just the means of sand. Regular beach sand is okay to use. There's no harsh chemicals or advanced technology. Again, the advanced technology is the osmosis system, which is a lot of people in Haiti are not able to afford that. Um, and it's inexpensive to produce. It costs $3 to produce one bio-bubbler. There's almost no maintenance. If the sand gets too dirty, all you have to do is swirl it with a stick. So as of now, we haven't had to do that. We've implemented one in October. And last but not least, education enables scalability and sustainability. That's a very big point because we have four Haitian students right now in Haiti helping us out. And we would love to give them some scholarship money. Um, and they're, we actually have um, these made. These are um, how-to flyers for the people of Haiti. And the four Haitian students are helping us out with this. They're passing. They're giving them. Um, they're actually giving these to people in Haiti and um, showing them how it's made. So these students know how to speak English and Creole. Um, so they are able to communicate to the people of Haiti as me and Rachel can. So some of the positive outcomes for the biobubbler, we have already designed four, seven biobubblers. Five of them are implemented in Haitian home, and two of them are back at the center, and we are doing more um, research on them, and we're doing more testing. So two of, um, so we are using, right now we're using water safe bacterial kits, but they're very basic kits, and we would love to get more advanced kits this kind of brings us into our resources. So under $5,000, there's a lot we can do. We can get more advanced kits that we would like. We are able to give each Haitian student $100. That's plenty for them. About an average Haitian person makes about $300 a year. So if we can give them at least 100, that's plenty for them. Another thing we would like to do is make a biobubbler that actually looks like a bubbler. Um, so that money can be used for that. Another um, resource is the additional filter units. Um, we just need additional units just for us, just to do more advanced testing on them and to um, 
continue with project. Thank you. What'd you think of that one? Why, why, why? Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. This PowerPoint actually isn't the right one. <laughs> She said, I'm um, a lot, and some of us do that. But that's something you want to try to watch. And the other thing I noticed is she kept looking up at the slides. You don't have to do that because there's going to be a podium with the laptop in front of you. So you, you should be able to see the slides, and we'll try to set it up so that you can. But the judges still did like the idea. They had questions. Yep, Stephen. Another thing I noticed was one of those tiny little distractions that could throw you, throw an audience member off. I noticed that she tried to the clicker and the microphone in the same hand or switch them off at a couple of times and that clanking caused the microphone to... So yeah, so another thing to think about, if you don't have some advance your slides, right, you've got a microphone and then you're going to have a clicker, right, and you want all those things going on. Uh, the other thing though that they had to deal with, and Holly reminded me, last year we had terrible problems with the AV system to the point where I had a hissy fit the next day. About it. And I had a big hissy fit, and uh, it was you would get the, so you heard that there was a clunking. Argh! That wasn't them. That was the AV system, and it got worse that night. So the fact that they just sort of you, Rachel kind of went what, and then she went right back on to the next beat. That's important. You got to be prepared for the unexpected, and you got to be able to keep the beat. Rachel is the one that opened yeah. and talked about the problem. She had you pulling for them, right? She had you emotionally pulling for them because of her pace, the inflection and everything. She had you pulling for them before they talked about the solution. It was so emotionally appealed. You wanted to hear the solution. That's right. yeah. So a good point here, right? Again, we want you to get, be on it. We want you to have teams, right? We want everyone to work together, but when it's time to make the pitch, internally on your team, you have to decide who are the best people to put up there. And we don't all have the same strengths. We don't all get to go to the same parties. I don't go to any of your parties. Oh. <laughs> Nothing against you. Just put it in the But you have to think about that, right? So you have to have an honest conversation about who, who's, who should do this. And, and who might not be, but who might have other strengths. I think I saw a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, not exactly a question. I was just going to say, um, I, I don't, I don't agree with someone I mentioned that like, said there was too much information. I think based on the idea, the backstory about KT and the standard of living was actually helpful to their presentation. I think it was a very good presentation. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I was meeting, so they end up connecting with the Haitian Development Center, which is run by. Professor Giles, and we submitted a $50,000 grant application that got turned down. But so we had a conversation with the, um, the judges the other day. And one of the things they asked about was specifically, why are you paying them $100? <laughs> Which was 
Okay. So, so we had to explain, because in, in that case, they didn't think $100 was enough. But then when you explain that, well, the annual <coughs> salary is $300, or our monthly salary. So, so you, you kind of have to put it into context. So I, I share this one for a couple reasons. I also share it to say, you don't have to be a pitching machine to, to place, okay? You got to have a good story. You got to be confident. You got to get that message out there. Make sure you hit the key points. Uh, one question that I have that's a little more general about this uh, whole competition. Uh, now it, it seems like a lot of us are developing products that we can actually sell and make a business out of. Uh, something like that water bubble, for example, that seems more like a charity case. So Good question. I, don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but no, I mean no, no. it's not something that's going to return the investment. It looks like it's something that's just going to benefit the people of Haiti, right. but not actually so there are different types of entrepreneurship, right? This uh, high growth entrepreneurship, lifestyle entrepreneurship, and this is an example of social entrepreneurship. So when we when we see a project like this, which really started as a more philanthropic project, what we do is meet with them to talk about how can you turn this into a sustainable venture. A non, it can be nonprofit. So we've had several groups that have come to us that have had an idea for working in the community or are doing a project, and what we want to move away from is we want to move away from something that you do for one class and then it ends. Right? We want to help you to make it sustainable. So this has actually been turned into a nonprofit project. They're working on a model. They're, they're implementing it. They, they got funding. They went to Haiti. They now have um, employees that work in Haiti on the implementation of this project. And we're helping them to figure out, okay, how can you sustain this? How much money? Now they know how much it costs per unit. Now they know how much it costs in Haiti. They kind of know what their overhead is. So now they're in a better position to put together a business plan to just create a nonprofit. So creating a nonprofit or a more than profit is fine. Right? Some of you have products, it's really clear. Some of you know you want to start a business, but other folks have a, a cause that they want to address. And so you still have to come up with a business model that will allow you to pay people for their work whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit. Good question. Yes, Deb? I just want to chime in. Non-profit does not mean you can't make money. Okay. You make money, but instead of paying it out to shareholders, you put the money invested back into the non-profit. So you can, the university is a non-profit. Hospitals are non-profit. So don't think that just because it's non-profit, it's charitable. You can make some money off. They're still businesses. Yeah, they're still businesses. And they could have gone a different route. They could have gone, we're going to be a for-profit company, and we're going to sell our product to nonprofits that want to implement in other countries. So there are different ways you can do this. The other thing, too, and we've learned this over the last three years, uh, like they're, they're affiliated with the Haitian Development Center. So that kind of gives them a nonprofit organization to work with. So you might be thinking, okay, the first thing I have to do is file the paperwork for my business. Nah, you know, that's not the first thing you have to do. The first thing you have to do is come up with a good idea, test it out, raise a little money, see if you can move it forward. You don't really want to spend the time to incorporate and do all that until you're really sure that this thing's going to take off. So we've been able to partner up some of the student projects with either other existing companies or other nonprofits to carry them, right? To give them a base, to give them a place where they win money, other money at other places, they need a place to deposit it. So we've worked with other companies to do that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just kind of finishing off that thought. Um, then angel investors, are are those investors that expect return on their investment, or are they investors that expect us to complete our product and push forwards without giving them that? Fair question. Angel investors are investing because they expect a return on their investment. Now. So an angel investor is not likely to invest in a nonprofit organization. So you have to find, you, didn't, you might you'll have to bootstrap it. You might find foundations that will give you some support to get it off the ground until your business model kicks in. So, yeah, I love that though. Uh, angel investors do understand that there's a risk to losing the money. Oh, well, they absolutely do. So if you pay, it's not like you're just going to lose Right, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And you won't owe us any money either. So. <laughs> Just back to that whole concept of a nonprofit or for profit. Even today, very few deep pocketed individuals or foundations or government agencies or non government organizations like the Red Crow, whatever, it's not about throwing money at problems. 
just to throw money at problems. It's to throw money at problems to actually solve the problem and have an impact. So they want to know that you have a good strategy, the right team, the right plan, and a way to actually solve the problem and be sustainable over the long term. How do you be sustainable? That you have that recurring profit that you can invest back into the business. So it's the same analysis, the same planning, the same structure. It's just as Deb said, the, the profits don't go to the investors, they go back into the business. So it's the same rationale, especially today. clear to the judges. The problem with this device is it's very simple, right? So it's basically a five gallon water jug with beach sand in it. Now, I got it immediately, right? Because for years I've had a saltwater fish tank that uses an undergravel filter. It takes about 30 days for the bacteria to build up in the gravel and then the bacteria will filter the tank. So I kind of knew what they were talking about. But the judges did it. So that was the question that they asked, right? They said, how, does this work? How do you know this works? And they said, well, they had already been to Haiti once, and they had tested it, and they had put in, I think the big issue is E. coli in the water. And so they could test for E. coli, and then over the course of several weeks, they would test it. Eventually, there would be no E. coli, and would filter it up. Um, but that, it's fair. Um, but that's one of those things where they told a good enough story that they hooked the judges, right? The judges wanted that thing to work. And so they were able, that was one of the first questions they asked, how do we know this works? And, the, and actually, um, the partner said, well, we have done some testing. We have used a certain level of test kits. We want to use some of the funding to buy a higher level of test kit so we can really validate. So if you think about this, this was a sort of, sort of early proof of concept. Um, and what they, they were doing was really testing it out. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, Professor Giles, there's a lot of these DIY projects on the web uh, but what he said is even something like this, you can download the instructions on the web, to actually implement it to get it to work, take someone to pay some attention to it. And understand you've got to wait 30 days and then think about how do we refine it. So even though it's something any of you could look up on the web and build, you may not get one that works right. And so what they're doing is they're sort of, the real value that they bring isn't this device. It's putting together the teams that are going to help the Haitian families understand how to implement it. And so, that nonprofit organization is really going to fund a service team that's going to go out into the villages and help people to implement. And people will pay for that, right? And they, because the cost is so low, it's something that's affordable for them to do. Yep. Uh, so, I, so I guess like what I was really trying to get at is how much. You mean I went to totally different <laughs> data? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Not the first time. <laughs> uh, so, I, like the big thing is like how much information slash technology. Right, so that's a good, we have some solar car guys here, right? So the solar car, right, you could go into a whole lot of information, right? Our solar cells are made out of this material, we use this type of battery, this, this, that. I think you would probably want to have a slide, right, that sort of maps it out, that has some detail on it, that you might discuss. The question they're going to have is, well, who's going to use this? Why are they going to use it? How reliable is it? What happens when there's no sun, right? How practical is it? So most of them are not going to ask, what type of battery are you using, right? There might be someone there, but you'll be ready to answer that. Um, so I think it's like kind of giving the conceptual to the point and, and saying, in your case, you can say, well, we have a prototype. We've been driving it around campus, and now we want to bring it into production. Um, and they were able to say, we have a prototype. We've tested it out, but we want to refine our procedures. So it's nice to be able to say, you've tested it and it works. If you have an idea, or a product or something new that is an idea that you haven't tested at all, that's why that's when it becomes really important to be able to say, we talked to 100 people who will use this. And this is what they've told us we should have in that device. Is that more on target? Okay. Yes? So practice doesn't just mean you in front of your mirror. You want to practice the whole experience. 
You want to practice the whole experience. If it's going to be more than you making a presentation, you want to do what a dress rehearsal as close to reality as possible so that you really have a feel for what that experience is going to be and the kind of issues that you're going to encounter. So it's not just knowing your content, right? It's how you want those judges to feel about your team when you complete your presentation. And you know, in order to do that, I, I was just thinking, so I've given some important speeches in front of large groups in the past. And it's one thing when I'm using a set of slides that I've used for the class, and, and I can kind of add a little bit. But when I'm giving, you have five minutes to say this. I'll script it all up, figure out what we're going to say, and then I'll pull together some of my colleagues, or even my, my family, uh, my toughest critics, right? They pick up every, Dad, you wave your hands too much. Dad, you said, um, Dad, your joke stunk. Don't tell that joke. What were you thinking? Um, so it's probably good to get some of that feedback. And then I'll sit down and I'll make some change. And, and then I'll just pull a couple of my sites. So would you guys mind listening again? And so you, I think pulling in some people who you know will be honest with you is important. We've covered a lot of territory tonight. The goal here was to help you sort of uh, ease some of your apprehension about the pictures, give you an idea of what it's going to be like, to show you a couple and get you thinking about it. Now, Holly, why don't you come up here and you can tell folks the next steps. Because clearly we're not done. I mean, we're done for tonight. <laughs> So when you guys came in and you registered uh, on the Swiper system, you should have received this paper. Does everyone have it? Or at least one per team? So first step is if you didn't already sign up for an advisory session, we highly, highly urge you to. It's about 30 minutes to an hour with one of our different Swiper faculty fellows and or staff. So let's, we'll sit down with you, we'll go through your entire idea plan, we'll go through your PowerPoint pitch, and you can actually make revisions to that. And you can submit those revisions to us by March 27th at 5 p.m. So it'll be the same thing. You'll email the PowerPoint to us, and then you'll log online with your UMass Old Credentials to that same uh, website that you initially submitted, and you can resubmit your advised materials. And those will be sent to the preliminary judges. And in addition to that, you have another deliverable of a poster which you will email to differencemaker at uml.edu. I emailed the template to everyone, and it's also available on our resource page. So you go to differencemaker, you click the idea challenge tab, and the resources tab. So it's there for you. So it's the same basic format that we use. You want to cover the problem, opportunity, solution, resources, team members. I think it's the year in school, and then major as well. Holly, why do they need the poster? So the poster. So is anyone, well, to start, is anyone here? Um, that did not, that's not a semifinalist team. So whoever is not a semifinalist team, if you submit a poster to us, you have a chance to win People's Choice Award. So that's an added benefit. So it gives those a chance that didn't make it through to maybe make it through to the finals. And then also at the finals, we display them all. So if you, so 25 teams right now made it through. Some who didn't still have the chance to submit a poster and win. Um, so the 25 teams, out of those, 10 will pitch off in the finals. So if you're not one of those 10 teams submitting that poster to us, if you show up on the final day and you stand by your poster, people will walk around with something called difference maker dollars, and they can actually invest in your poster. It's fake money. And whoever has the most can actually win the real money. So it's another opportunity for you to kind of display your project talk to people about it and convince them to put their dollars in your And that's probably a thousand dollar prize, right? Yeah, it's normally a thousand dollars, so. It's a good chunk of money. So definitely, definitely submit that poster. Are there any other questions? Oh, can I add one thing? Yes. When you come to the advisory session, please do prepare with your presentation. I mean, you discuss the key in that presentation. So if you come with that presentation, it's harder to, to pitch to test that. Yeah, so bring a printout copy of your idea plan as well as your PowerPoint, and then whoever your advisors will go through all of that with you. You can take notes on it and then resubmit those revisions to us. Any other last questions? So if you didn't sign up yet, come see me and we can get you penciled into one of these blocks.